fantastic. We're very fickle people, journalists. Um, well, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm glad you've all been numbed into a state of critical insensibility by a couple of glasses of House White. Um, I, won't, um, I won't detain you terribly long. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, uh, professionally and sort of emotionally biased towards the physical realities of architecture. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's very important not to overlook the metaphorical aspects of the, of, of the word itself. I mean, we talk about you know, architecture as the art and science of making buildings, but of course computer engineers talk about the architecture of the computer. And I think that's very revealing of some sort of structural reality in the human mind. And there's a fascinating Renaissance concept, by the way, of um, the memory palace. Um, it was the most famously formulated by an Italian merchant called Matteo Vici. And the memory palace is this, that if you want to remember something, you have to imagine the plan of a building. And you leave the I each idea you want to remember is in, left in a different room. And when you want to recall the sequence of ideas, you literally go on an imaginative walk around the building. I'm only telling you that just to enforce like, what I believe is the, is the absolutely fundamental, you know, real and metaphorical significance of architecture. Architecture is about environments, the greater whether it's a real one or in fact a virtual one. Now, the essential truth is for me, the limp-wristed esthete amongst you hard-nosed technicians, is that uh, we make our environments and then our environments, of course, you know, make us. I mean, just think I often imagine to myself how very, very different a character Harry Potter would have been. Um, had Hogwarts actually looked as deadening and depressing as Tesco. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean it's, it, it's, it's real. I mean, you can't emphasize this enough that uh, I'm often asked, how do you know about uh, whether a building is any good? And after years of thinking about whether a building is any good and writing about it a bit, I, there's a very simple answer. It's quite difficult to define it, but it's always easy to detect it. A building is good if it makes you feel better. And those of you who have been spending the last three or four hours in this building, now tell me later whether you think it's, you're feeling better um, for it. Now, school architecture is actually um, both poorly understood and not well appreciated all the same, all the same time. When the great architecture historian, Nicholas Pevsner, wrote a terrific book called uh, The History of Building Types in 1976, um, schools were not even included in his the building types, although prisons and hotels were. I suppose you might say that a school is a, some sort of mediation between a prison and a hotel. But any, anyway, um, uh, there's been very little, very little. You know, I mean, architects have thought for a long time about you know palaces, houses, churches, whatever. But there's been very little formalized thinking, re relatively speaking, in the historical perspective about um, school design. Of course, the 1870 Education Act was absolutely fundamental in this respect, you know, the board school, so-called created by it, you know, brought, you know, hygiene and sense and order uh, where no such things had existed before. Um, but they also brought a sort of uh, segregated hierarchy, which was, you know, perhaps um, uninten unintentional. Um, and they also were built to a cost rather than a principle. I mean, I'm absolutely besotted by the idea um, that great civilizations are remembered by the monuments and the artifacts they leave behind, not by their public sector borrowing requirements. I think, you know, principles rather than cost are always the most important thing. There's a marvelous description in, in, uh, in, in Charles Dickens, of course, of you know, Do the Boys Hall. Now, here's the, here's the very, I'll be very, very brief, but this is the classic uh, description of 19th century educational horror. This is where Mr. Wackford Squeers, of course, had all his unwanted youth collected together. And it, they were boarded, clothed, booked, furnished with pocket money, provided with all necessaries, instructed in all languages, living in debt, mathematics, orthography, geometry, astronomy, trigonometry, the use of globes, algebra, single stick writing, arithmetic, fortification, and every other branch of class, classical literature. All this in this appallingly forbidding environment, which they, of course, uh, uh, the second most amusing description of a school in literature after, after, after Dickens, of course, is Evelyn Wars farcical Clanaba Castle, which he wrote about in Decline and Fall. Um, a lot of that stuff, though, the Dickensian stuff, is actually in a different way, um, you know, still troubling us. I mean, I don't mean that, I mean, obviously, Gothic horror is a thing of the past, but it's been replaced, I think, by other horrors in school design. Unintelligent plans, inappropriate materials, terrible energy performance, and a deadening lack of courage and vision, and all the other things you actually need to create great building design. There are, as I say, very, very few masterpieces in the international history of school architecture. Why is that? Well, I think the answer is actually uh, quite simple. It's not because we lack great architects, but uh, we lack great clients. 
and the client is at least as, an, as important a part in any building project as, um, you know, as the architect. Great architecture depends on a, um, a great client. And I think too often schools, are, as I said, are, are, are concerned with expediency and crude assumptions about you know, uh, an accountant's version of costs rather than with vision. Something wonderful uh, Mark Twain once said was this, in the first place, God made idiots. That was just for practice. Then he made school boards. Anyway, um, so to understand what a good school building um, should be, I think you, if you're some of you maybe clients or the clients we're going to nag later, you need to have a very, very clear idea of what it is you want to achieve. Now, that sounds obvious, but it's a principle which is um, overlooked um, really surprisingly often. What I wonder is the absolute essence of education. I, mean, I rather sometimes think it might be that old Chinese proverb, which I always like, that if you ask a question of anything, that makes you look humble and stupid for about five minutes. But if you've never asked a question, you remain stupid uh, for your entire life. Most thoughtful architects, uh, I think, working in school design today, think the current, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm glad uh, <laughs> Marius Morris is gone. Most current architects I've spoken to think current government policy is wrong. Um, well, one of them, one of the best architects working in schools today is a guy called young Simon Henley, who's absolutely convinced that current thinking in school design will cre uh, create a generation of glazed morons with no more discipline than is necessary to, uh, you know, to change channels on the television. Simon Henley told me once, the government wants schools to look like shops with big graphics and bright colours. They're frightened of tradition, frightened of the idea that children should even be a little intimidated by school. I'm not afraid of ethics and tradition. I like institutions. Institutions are good. And this is from a very young, very, very hip architect who's just designed a wonderful school based on a medieval cloister in Ealing, which I uh, strongly recommend uh, um, you visit. Now, I don't think we should be disdainful, by the way, about, I mean, I'm both sort of mass massively keen on change and also massively keen on tradition. I don't think, by the way, notwithstanding what the earlier speaker said, we should be too uh, resistant about the idea of the traditional book. Never forget that when, um, when a man called Nicholas Negro Ponte decided to found um, the founder of the Media Lab at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, when he wanted to write a campaigning thing about the importance of computing, a book called, a book called Going Digital, it had to be a paper book, of course. I mean, the book is still, of course, as everybody knows, still the most, uh, the most efficient interactive data retrieval system. Uh, so let's not forget that. But remember, the new school architecture is going to have to... Uh, to be good, it's going to have to reflect uh, a very complex psychological and practical reality today, as well as responding to the, the, the very best elements um, of tradition. One of the most interesting books I've read in recent years uh, was by an American guy called Stephen Robinson. I don't know how many of you know this, but it's called Everything, Everything Bad is Good for You. Uh, Robinson argues that today that kids, uh, because of the, their exposure to new systems and whatnot, kids aren't getting dumber, they're becoming different. New technologies are not limiting, they're positively stimulating. I mean, email it encourages writing, while texting requires, you know, a, you know, adroit fingers, imagination, and ingenuity. Great subtlety. It's like writing a text is like writing a haiku. It's wonderful. And for every pedant, uh, you know, who deplores the abbreviations and ellipses and neologisms of text world, let's remember that, you know, expressions like Mr. and Mrs. are, you know, are abbreviations too. Video games, well, it's very easy to argue that something like, you know, Grand Theft Auto requires levels of spatial sophistication, a conceptualization, and abstract thought that way beyond the means of a Renaissance architect. I'm serious. I mean that's for the players, not for the people who actually designed it. New school architecture, I think, has got to create this curious dynamic between holding on to the very best of tradition and investigating all the possibilities of, you know, of, uh, of new media. It's got to encourage creative thinking, not, in, not impose a template of you know, doctrinaire attitudinizing. Um, what it actually looks like, and as I'm the esthete, uh, what it actually looks like is a matter for individual clients and their architects and immediate local needs and local context. What it looks like is less important than what it does. But if you believe me and if you're interested in design, you will actually also believe that if something does something well, it'll look good too. Okay, thank you.